Hello everyone. I'm very happy to introduce to you our first speaker in track A, Stephanie Schirmer. She is a software engineer at Etsy and an alumni at Hacker School in New York. And she's going to talk today about dynamic programming with grammars, algebras, and products. Enjoy. Hello, good morning. This is the first time I'm testing this mic, but it's working. So great. Um, I'm very happy to be here today and talk about dynamic programming. Uh, but first of all, why? why? Why do we want to do dynamic programming and how does it work? Um, so we want to do this to solve combinatorial optimization problems. That means these problems have a combinatorial part. Um, we have some counting to do. We have to enumerate all possible solutions of a recursive kind of problem. And then we have the optimization part, so we have to find a desired solution. Whatever desired means for us, it could be that we're looking for a maximum score of some sort, or something like that. And examples for this kind of problem could be the Boggle problem, where you're searching words in a grid of characters. So how do you enumerate the potential words in this grid of characters in an optimal way? Um, another really nice example is the money-changing problem. I think it's the smallest dynamic programming problem that I could find. Um, so imagine you have an amount of money and you have some coins. So how can you decompose this amount of money with these given coins? And another example that we use quite often in bioinformatics is um, text or sequence alignment, which we use to find out how similar sequences are. So we would use this for bio sequences, for example. For example, for a DNA, how similar is the DNA of me to the DNA of a mouse, for example. And another example from bioinformatics would be RNA structure prediction. So it's the prediction of the structure of a molecule which can form base pairs with, with itself when it's folding back onto itself. But let's get started with some really classic dynamic programming. I don't know um, how many of you have done dynamic programming before, maybe you want to raise your hand. Yeah, quite a few, that's, that's really good. Um, so we're going to review it really quick. Um, if I want to solve a dynamic programming problem and I go open my algorithms book and I look into it, it will tell me do these four steps. Characterize the structure of an optimal solution, recursively define the value of an optimal solution, Compute the value of that optimal solution and then construct the optimal solution like what it looks like from this computed info. Okay, let's do this. So if we think about the money changing problem, uh, we have our coins here. Let's say we have one, three and four dollar coins and we have some given amount of money, for example five. Um, and first of all, the first step is that my algorithm's book says characterize the structure of an optimal solution. So if I want to decompose this number five, um, what's an optimal solution? It's some kind of a sum, right? Um, and it would be the sum that's composed of these values of these coins, one, three, and four. Okay, <clears throat> okay the second step. Recursively define the value of an optimal solution. How do we do that, recursively define it? We do that with a thing that we call recurrences. So there are these um, equations here, and this d of n is appearing again on the right side. So there's some kind of um, recursion going on. And for our money changing problem, this would be the recurrence for the decompositions d, for the amount of n that we want to decompose. So we could define this d of n in terms of smaller subproblems. And because we want to have a sum, we could say if we just subtract one of these coins, one, three, or four, um, we would get one of these smaller subproblems. We would get a smaller sum, and we have to decompose that then in the next step. And if we are at zero, we're done. That's the base case, because we cannot decompose it further, right? Okay. Uh, the next step would be to compute the value of an optimal solution. So let's keep in mind we want to count the ways how to decompose these five dollars. So how many ways are there? And usually in dynamic programming we do this with a table, um, and we do this in a bottom-up fashion. We have a really small table here. Um, so here we can have our table, and this value n 
it goes up to 5, because 5 is what I want to decompose. Um, and this is the final problem that I want to solve. And then for D, I'm going to write down the solution for that particular sum. So if I want to fill this table, I can follow these arrows. I made these arrows here, like just to help our thinking a bit, to make it a bit easier. For this one dollar coin, it's very simple. We just go like just in steps of one, and then for the three dollars, you would go, for example, from this zero um, to the end of three, um, because we go in steps of three, and so on. And then for the four dollars, we just have these two arrows left, right? Um, and then how do we get these six paths? So every time we're filling a cell and every time we're drawing a new arrow, we have to keep in mind in how many ways we could go before, how many ways were there before to get to that path. So that's how I come up with this number of six in the end. And then there's the fourth step. And the fourth step is usually the complicated step. Construct an optimal solution from the computed information. So in our case, that means how do I get my sums back? If I have the six, how do I get my sum out of it? So I have to somehow go from this last position in the table, where the six is, backwards, and figure out all these ways in which my solution was built up. At the same, same time, all of them. And that's usually the complicated step. Um, in this variant of the question that I posed, there is not even an optimization step. We're simply following all the paths at once. once. Um, but we could as well vary the problem, and we could say we want to look for the minimum number of coins to decompose these five dollars. Okay, that sounds great. Good news, everyone. Dynamic programming solves optimization problems. Over a large, that means exponential search space, in a reasonable amount of time, which means polynomial for us, right? Um, it's tractable by a computer. But there's a huge but. <laughs> It's not that easy, actually. Um, so the bad news is, um, as we say, the development of successful dynamic programming recurrences is a matter of experience, talent, and luck. That's what we said in my former research group, and it's kind of true. Uh, actually, it's really hard to get it right. So um, this kind of problem was really small. We had a very small table, and it has just one dimension, so it was kind of easy to see what's going on. But imagine this table could be two-dimensional, or it could be even four-dimensional, or we could have multiple tables, and then it gets really hard. So what can we do? How can we alleviate this? And in our group, we came up with a new way to reason about dynamic programming, um, and to automate all these ugly parts of it. So this is going to be great. How can we do this? Um, first of all, we will start with an example, and then we will learn that candidates are trees, questions are algebras, and programs are grammars. And then we will also learn about products, which give us a lot of power and make these computations fun. So let's go. Um, let's start with an example, the life of the universe and all the rest. You all know where this is going. Um, and for this example, I want you to forget everything you know about dynamic programming. Forget everything. Forget about the money-changing problem. Uh, just think that we have some magical device that lets us see at each step how the score of our solution of the dynamic programming problem is, and how does the solution look like that we constructed. So let's just imagine we have this magic device to see this. Let's say we get this answer. It's 42. <laughs> we don't know what it is yet, but we can use our magic device to find out. Um, so what was the question? What actually happened here? Let's do this. Let's go back one step. Okay, <laughs> there's a funny tree. So we have this funny tree which has some match at the top, and then it has some outermost children which say B. And there is some smaller number now, it says 30. So it's some kind of score. What's actually happening here? We don't know yet, but we're going to write it down. I like writing stuff down, it's great. Um, so we're going to write down this little equation here. Um, and because it's not easy to write, uh, write down the tree, like this entire thing here, we're writing it like a formula. We write match A, X, A. And then, um, yeah, because we know there's some letter, we don't really care what that letter is, but it seems to be matching. This B is matching with this B. And then something is going on recursively in the middle. Um, 
So also, uh, the other thing we write down is we know what's happening to the score. We know there's some plus 12 going on. Because before it was 42, and now it's 30. So we're writing that down as well. And next step, another match appeared. And actually what happened here is we can use the same equation to write it down. So there seems to be a reoccurring thing happening. That's really cool, we figured something out. So uh, if you look at this now, there's some V O at the side of some V O. What's going on? I think we should go back a few more steps to have a look. Okay. Something crazy is happening now. There's some divergence going on. There seems to be a choice. Um, there's a maximum going on. So we have two different scores. This 18 in the left side and in the right side we have minus 10. There's a choice going on of the maximum score. Let's write that down again. So I'm writing down in the bottom. I already wrote it. Choice of the maximum score. Very interesting. Um, so what's going to be happening in the next steps? Um, why are these two numbers different? Is there actually something different happening in the two branches now? Let's have a look. Okay. <laughs> actually, that's true. There are two different things happening. So in the left side, there is happening a replacement. And in the right side, there is happening a deletion. So we can read now from this top at the tree, we can read something like B O B, and then we can read uh, B O S, or we could read for the right side, we could read B O B, and then just B O, and then there's nothing. <clears throat> so that seems very strange. Um, so we're writing down replace. Replace of two different letters, L and R, left and right. Uh, because they seem to be different, um, is happening, and it costs us minus 2 from the computation. And delete is also happening, and it also costs us minus 2. So now we already figured something out, and we can fast forward, because we kind of have an idea how this works. Okay, fast forward a bit. Uh, we do a bunch of matches at once. Here, match, match, match. Um, and now we can see there's actually a string alignment going on. And in the same way, we can also, again, write down what happened. We can see the match, deletion, and replacement. They're still the same as in the previous steps. I wrote them down here because my tree has grown. And we can see we have two different kinds of alignments of Bobcon, Bobcon and Boskov going on. Um, so first of all, on the left side, we have a replacement at first. And then we have these two matches of the K and O. And these matches, they are really important because they give us the highest score. And this seems to be the winner because of that, because of these two matches. And in the right side, we did the deletion at first. Um, and then we did all these replacements here. Um, and then there's this empty string where the alignment ends. OK, very interesting. Uh, what happened? We found two alignments of Bob Kondov and Voskov. And they are quite different, as I said. Uh, the first one wins because it has these two extra matches in here. I just wrote it down as letters here. Um, and the second one loses. It has a score of only 14. But what we can see from this, or what we can learn from this, is that each alignment and each score are represented by the same formulas. These formulas that we have written down in the process. So let's summarize this reverse engineering exercise. The result of a dynamic programming algorithm is the value of a formula, which is built from evaluation functions, which are functions that take us from the tree, the tree that we had, to that number, this, this number that's yellow. And they are interleaved with applications of a choice function. And the choice function, in our case, it was the maximum, the maximum function. Uh, it's selected between the left and the right tree in our case. And what we can also see is that the applications of the choice function seem to propagate to the top. So at the top, we kind of knew that we took this 42 branch. What we also see is that formulas are candidate solutions. So with formulas, I mean now these trees. We can see it as a tree or as a formula in the way we write it down. It's the same thing. And then input sequences are also part of the formula. So when we read around the leaves of the tree, if you remember this Bobcon tree and you just read around it, 
Uh, we call this the yield, and this is actually the input sequence of my algorithm. So my two input sequences were BobConf and BossConf, and I could read them around the tree as the leaves. Okay, <laughs> let's reverse engineer this reverse engineering exercise. Um, because from this we can deduce a procedure, how to solve a dynamic programming problem. So first of all, we are just reversing the order of these four steps. Uh, we said, uh, first of all, the fourth step, the input sequences can be found at the leaves. What does that mean for us? We do this first, we read at first the input sequence. And from the input sequence, we construct all candidate solutions as formulas. And then what we do is we move the applications of the choice function, which was the maximum function in our case, we move it down, we push it down inside the formulas as far as possible. And then we also evaluate the formulas to get the desired result, to get our number, in our case, 42. Any dates are trees. <laughs> what do I mean by this? Let's see. <coughs> so if we think a bit about our method, um, several steps of our method could be automated. The steps of reading the input, applying the choice function, evaluating, these steps they are always the same. So we could totally automate them and we could write a program to do that. The computer can do it. The talent and experience, of course we want to get rid of the luck part, um, they go into constructing the candidates. So constructing the candidates means how do I decompose my problem into sub-problems? And which candidates arise for a specific given input? So how do I decompose my problem for this specific input then? And also, what does a desired candidate look like? Um, what's a good candidate and what's a bad candidate? And how do I score it to make the good candidates come up? And to do this, to express the candidate's construction, we need some kind of language. We need a language uh, for formulas, or we could say trees. The good thing is, we have such a language, and with this language, constructing candidates can also be automated. That's really great, because this means we get everything for free, except for the creative part, um, where we think about this decomposition of the problem and these kind of things. Um, actually, we don't get it all for free, because we wrote a compiler to do this for us, and we wrote the third generation of this compiler, so we put a lot of work into it, but you get the idea, you could get it for free. Okay. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the first building block of our little programming language that I'm going to show you. Uh, the signature, it looks like this. So when we think about the alignment, we wrote down these reoccurring functions, like delete or match, right? And I'm going to include match into replace from now on, so there's no match here, don't be scared. But they have the same number of arguments, it's just a subcase. And then there's this empty thing going on, uh, which we already talked about. And then there's the choice, choice, which was the maximum function, right? Um, and this is some kind of abstract description of this way of working. So we're saying we don't know what the answer looks like, but we know it has this kind of form. So we could say the signature is some kind of data type at the root of every dynamic programming problem. We could say this data type, usually we just don't see it if we just look at the problem. Because in the normal dynamic programming approach, the candidates, they are never represented. We don't know what they look like, so we never see this data type, but it's there, it's hiding. Okay, my favorite part. <laughs> Questions are algebras. Um, so when... Uh, when I imagine I can build my search space now, let's just imagine we have some magic way to describe my candidates and how they are being built. I don't know how yet, but let's just imagine that's a given for now. But how do I ask a question? How do I say, give me please the maximum scoring alignment? How, how do I ask that to my setup? Uh, this we can do with evaluation algebras. So this is happening <coughs> in what we call the evaluation phase. What's happening there exactly? So there are two things happening. First of all, there's the scoring of the candidates, um, and then there's also the making of choices. And these two things, they're all encompassed in the evaluation algebra. 
which is just a bunch of functions. Functions for scoring and one function for making the choice. Let's talk about these choice functions first. So in our example from the beginning, our choice function was the maximum function, right? You all remember it. So we're looking for the maximum scoring alignment, for example. But in fact, there could be a variety of choice functions. We could come up with whatever we like. It's our creative part. Um, but what all of these functions must have in common is that they map a list of values to a list of values, like indicated at the bottom here. Um, so even if we just end up with one value in the end, like with a maximum, um, we still have to keep it in a list. It's just a list with one, one value then. And we can see here, <laughs> the maximum is very popular, <laughs> it's at the top, and the minimum is also very popular. And what happens then if you say, I can give you the best one, then somebody comes from your office next door and they say, oh, can you give me the five best ones? So you have this max k, which is also really popular. And what you could also do is, you could do an enumeration. Um, so you could have the identity function and just keep everybody in the space. This is really interesting to inspect the entire space, but it could be really, really expensive, costly, because you have to enumerate all your solutions, right? And then you could do other things, like combinatorics. The simplest form would be just summing up everything in the entire space. And what you could also do uh, is sampling, and then it gets really interesting. Um, so you could have some random choice from your search space. Okay. How does this uh, scoring of alignments work? Um, this works with an algebra, um, the scoring algebra or evaluation algebra, we call it. And here we see, when we look at it, we see it says something like, algebra score implements a line. And we know this a line already, so it's implementing our signature. Um, and we know exactly what functions should be in this algebra from the signature. It only works when all of these functions are ready. So I have there replacement, deletion, insertion, um, and empty. And you can see the scoring is happening there. So in the functions themselves, the scoring is happening. Um, and it quite fits what we have seen in our reverse engineering exercise. So you have the 12 and the minus 2 in here. And you can, when you evaluate, you can say, um, yeah, we have our formula here. So this is actually our candidate from the slide. I just <coughs> collapsed the tree for you so it fits on the slide and abbreviated this match replacement. You can see it, you can read it, I think. And there's the dollar in the middle, and then we get our 42. So we could evaluate it like this. And if we imagine we're writing it like this, we can imagine we could put this into a computer. Putting a tree into it is hard, but this formula we could totally feed into a, a computer. What's also really great about the scoring algebras is that they are very versatile. Um, we could easily have variants of the problem. We could say we vary our problem, so for example for the alignment, we could say we want to have a fine gap cost. So if we're opening something, something in the alignment, because we do an insertion or a deletion, we're like opening a gap, right? That's how we call it. And we could say we want to make it cheaper to extend the gap and more expensive to open it. So in that, uh, when we do that, um, we make it, make it more likely to have one big gap than many scattered small gaps. And this could be done by just adding two extra functions to the algebra. So we could have something like, delete extend and insert extend and give them different costs and we're done. And I could also do the same thing if I wanted to make my alignment local. So if I don't want to align the entire string, like my bobconf and bossconf, the entire string, but I wanted to ask the question, give me the best local match in it. That means I could arbitrarily skip something in one of the input strings, right? I could just go to a place where they match better. So I would need functions for this. Skip left and skip right. Or I could even combine these two questions into one. It's up to me. Let's talk about RNA. <laughs> That's also one of my favorite topics. That's what I did my PhD on. So uh, this is an RNA molecule. It's the little sister of DNA. It's a single-stranded molecule. And uh, it folds back onto itself to form these base pairings, as you can see. Um, and then has some double-stranded regions. 
And it has several building blocks, which you can see in this picture. So you can see there's this single-stranded region here in the bottom where it's not paired, and there's a paired part, and it can have bulges. And there's this huge multiple loop in the center, which has many arms. Uh, there could be an internal loop, and there's a stacking region here, which consists just of stacked base pairs, which stack on top of each other, and they're very stable. Um, and you could have something like this hairpin loop, where it's just going around, and there are some unpaired bases in this loop. Um, so these are the building blocks of RNA, but uh, if I think about how would I use this in an algebra now, um, let's just imagine one exercise. Let's just imagine we just want to print out this molecule as a string of dots and brackets to make it easier to read it in the computer. Um, so every time we encounter a single-stranded region, like down there, or a single-stranded region could be in the bulge, in the multi-loop, um, every time we encounter a single-stranded region like that, um, we put a dot for each base um, that's, that's not paired, and every time we have a base pair, we put a bracket. So we could put something like some opening brackets down here for the lower part of the single strand uh, um, of the paired bases here, and then at the end of our entire molecule, when we go around, we have the closing brackets. Can you imagine this? <coughs> so how would we do this as an algebra? Um, how would we how would we get this um, how would, would we get these building blocks and print them? Imagine our building blocks, uh, we have them as functions, so we have abstracted them in a way. So here we have SR, SR, you can read it there, SR, it's a stacking region, stacking region where they're just these base pairs, and then we have this HL for the hairpin loop, which was this loop that's going around. Um, and then with these functions we can say what the algebra should do, and we just print out the molecule in this way of dots and brackets here. We're telling this, uh, we are, we're calling this pretty print because it's pretty printing um, the molecule. And for the first term, which is the second, second region, we're just adding a base pair. So you can see here in this append, there's one opening bracket, there's one closing bracket, and then we go down recursively in the middle. Um, yeah, the base pair is just a pair of brackets, and for the hairpin loop, which would be down here, HL, hairpin loop, uh, which was this thing with this uh, yeah, looping around. There we would have a region of unpaired dots in the middle. So here you can see there's this append of the dot and size of region there in the middle. So that's why we have this construct there. Uh, if we look at an example, RNA structure, which could look like this. So there's some stacking region here, there's this multiple, multiple, loop, multiple loop here. And then there are some unpaired bases, like here's the hairpin loop HL, you can see that the looping part are always used. Um, we could evaluate it like this. And as we can see, we can use this yeah, for extensive programs and for real world problems in bioinformatics, for complicated problems. Um, and then let's say we just want to count the RNA structures. Uh, then we actually don't have to write anything because, yeah, it's very short, the compiler does it for us. We can just write this a bit weird line, algebra, my count, auto count. And then when we evaluate this, uh, we see there's just one folding of it. So for the counting, we would just get one. It's just one structure. Okay. Programs are grammars. So this is the last part that's missing, right? How, how does it all work? There's, yeah, it still doesn't fit together. There's a piece missing. Let's re recapitulate where we are. Um, we know now how to represent candidates. We know now how to score and choose candidates. We still need to know which are the candidates for a given input. We skip this part, right? Um, so if I have an input string, how do I get the tree out of it? And we can do this um, using tree grammars. I think or I hope that most people here are familiar with string grammars. Um, string grammars describe languages of strings, right? And from the grammar we can automatically derive a parser which recognizes the strings that are in the language. So the parser could say, oh, this string is in the language, or this string I reject, it's not in there. And the tree grammar, it's a really similar thing. It describes a language of trees. So. Our candidates are trees, right? 
And that's right what we need. So these trees, they have, an, they have the input strings as the yield sequence, we said. They, they have the input strings around the leaves, right? And a yield parser, that's what we call it, um, can derive this automatically from a grammar. So it reads the yield, it reads the input string, and then it generates the corresponding candidate. So it's generating the corresponding tree based on the grammar, which has the right sequence around its leaves. That's pretty fascinating. How does it work? How would such a grammar look like? Um, this again is actually a piece of code which would work with our compiler and it's a grammar for our alignment. And it looks a bit like the grammars that you know from theoretical computer science. So there's an alternative operator, um, we have this whole clause here, this grammar clause uh, alignment, and we have an axiom where we start, it's called a Ali alignment. And um, then there's this last line, there's this really interesting thing, there's this H. Uh, and that's the objective function. That's the function where the, that was the maximum in our first example, for example. It could be any other function again. Um, but uh, this is the application of the function. So it would be applied to the entire clause with all these um, variants of it. And all these cases, replacement, deletion, and insertion, they are recursive. So the alignment is uh, happening in there again. Um, this is just a different way to write like what the outermost children are, the different syntax. And um, actually this is uh, how we would write it for, uh, for the computer, uh, completely like this. <clears throat> and, but uh, the way I have it in my head, it's slightly different because in my head I think in trees. So for me, <laughs> it would look like this. Um, the tree grammar would look like this. I would have this one clause, uh, just the alignment clause. And I would have these little trees, the little replacement tree, deletion tree, insertion tree, and then the empty. And in all these little trees, I could plug in another tree, because it, under the replacement, for example, there's the alignment again, so I could plug in the next tree, and I could construct my giant tree and build it up in this way from, from this grammar. Now we have all our building blocks together. With all these building blocks together, we have an evaluation signature, uh, which we call a sigma. We have this tree grammar, which we call G over sigma. We have a concrete evaluation algebra, uh, which we call A, um, with an objective function H. And with all these parts together, I can make an algebraic dynamic programming algorithm, as we call it. The thing that I can just feed into my compiler and it just works. But wait, what was this thing on the last slide? Satisfying Behrman's principle. I said here, right? Satisfying Behrman's principle. Let's have a look at this. Um, so Behrman's principle of optimality is actually really, really, really important. It's the thing why dynamic programming works. And uh, Richard Behrman in 1964, he's like the father of dynamic programming, you could say. He said, an optimal solution can be produced solely from optimal solutions to subproblems. Really interesting. So. If I think about this for a minute, <laughs> in my own words, I would say something like moving the choice function around in the formula shouldn't affect the final result list. That means I can, if I have the optimal results and I combine them, uh, it will still be optimal, right? So where do I do this choice? It doesn't really matter. If I do it down in my tree or up in my tree, it doesn't matter. So I could push it down in my tree. The interesting thing is that yeah, this is a requirement, it's not a theorem. So we have to prove it for each of our algebras. And we can prove this by proving the distributivity of the choice function over the scoring function. But actually for the maximum function, or functions like that, it just works. We don't have to do anything real good. Okay, there's one last part we have to talk about to understand how this all works, and that's what we call the phase amalgamation part. So imagine we have given all our parts, the grammar, the algebra, the input string. We can just evaluate it and we get some value. Three, for example. Let's uh, say, for example, we're folding RNA. We're looking for how many base pairs are in the folded result and we get the result of three. So if we think about how this works in our conceptual view in our head, 
we could say, first of all, there's this yield parsing going on, and then it's constructing the same space of candidates with all the trees in it, my search space, it's all there. And then there's a second phase, where all these trees, they are transformed one by one into numbers, the yellow numbers, and then we choose the best one. But actually that's not true. That's not true because it would be way too slow. In reality, both of these phases are merged to make dynamic programming possible and to make it fast. And that's also why we push these choices down. So as soon as we constructed everything that's necessary, uh, we pick out the optimal choice. So let's talk about products. Uh, we first revisit again, where were we? Because this is really fast. Where do we stand? So uh, we can now describe algorithms on an abstract level. We can now generate correct and efficient code. Well, the compiler does it for us, right? Um, uh, we can independently, independently vary the tree grammar or the evaluation algebra. So we could, could plug in another algebra if we wanted to. And we could, can run one analysis at a time. But how about doing several analysis at a time? Wouldn't that be cool? If we could compute the best score of the alignment and then also print the best scoring candidate, we could actually look at the alignment and the score at the same time. I think that would be great. And this we can do with products of algebras. So uh, this is the product operator. We can just call it star here. And we give it two algebras and get a new algebra out of it. And what does this new algebra do? It computes pairs of answers. It does this just using the algebra functions from the two algebras I put in. So they have to be the same signature. It's combining the two algebra functions that I put in, component-wise, and then it's choosing. And the choosing with the choice function, it's happening in a dependent way. First, it's choosing according to the first objective, and then according to the second objective. Intuitively, we would think again, there are two phases going on. First of all, we compute all these candidates, like uh, via the algebra functions, and then we apply the combined objective function H from the two objective functions in the end. But in reality, again, these phases are all interleaved. It's all happening at the same time to make it fast. Uh, but still, we can write it down in this really nice way. It, it's all separate in this way we define it. So that's a real luxury that we can write it like this. We can think about it in a better way. <clears throat> and what's also great is uh, we don't have to do any extra programming. We don't have to do any extra debugging. We just have to make sure that our combined algebra still satisfies Behrman's principle of optimality. So just prove that and you're done. So now we can do many fun things with products because they are so powerful. For example, we could look for the number of co-optimal solutions to a problem. When we're looking at the foldings with the maximum number of base pairs, for example, uh, we could count them to see which amount of the folding space is optimal, like how many of them are optimal. <clears throat> What's also great is the second point, uh, the easy candidate output. It's easy to see the candidate at the same time with the score. So we could say the backtracking step, we almost get it for free. Um, if we maximize base pairs, for example, and then we print what does this actual folding look like as a string of dots and brackets, like we're used to, we can actually see the folding for the best result alongside with it. And what's also really nice is a concept that we call classified dynamic programming. So this is a bit like combining the previous ideas. We could ask a question where the first algebra is separating our search space into classes or into different spaces, we could say. Um, so, for example, we could say we take the folding space with all the folded molecules in it and we want to separate it by the shape and then we want to count how many of these different shapes are in this group. Uh, we could do this uh, yeah, with something like this shape star count thing here. And then we could also ask for each of these shape groups, which one of the structures is the best one? Which one has the most base pairs, for example, in each of these classes? And it's also really useful for ambiguity checking. So if you want to check your grammar, if it's built in a good way, um, this can be really useful. You can do something like pretty print the candidate, and then you count it, and it should always be one. 
if you if it appears twice, you did something wrong in the way you constructed your grammar if you want it to be non-ambiguous. So you could work on that then. And also, um, you can do sampling again. So um, this is one of the products I can't really talk about today because it's more complicated, but it's really powerful. So if the space is too big, you can sample from it. And of course, you can do products of products. You can see, yeah, it's a powerful technique. You can combine it in any way. Um, using this algebraic dynamic programming, like we uh, like to call it, we developed a bunch of tools. So this is not just theory. This is actually working. Um, the compiler is working, and we developed many tools with it. And we got publications out of it. So this is just a bunch of bioinformatics tools that we developed. Uh, most of them are in RNA structure prediction and RNA structure alignment. Um, uh, but uh, they are not the only problems that you could solve with it. Um, we solved other problems with it, like optimal matrix chain multiplication, for example, or satisfiability problem. So it's not restricted to bioinformatics at all. <clears throat> so that's pretty cool. Let's recapitulate what's cool about algebraic dynamic programming. We have a list of advantages that we've seen. Uh, first of all, our work is reduced to the creative aspect, so all these horrible parts like the table axis and whoever implemented a dynamic programming algorithm that's a bit bigger, you know what I'm talking about, you have to fiddle with indices of tables all the time. We don't have to do it, the compiler is doing it for us and that's a great relief. And um, we have time to explore our ideas rather than debugging our code, which is really great. We can focus on this creative part. We can create reusable and reliable components. And these algebras, we can plug them in and out, asking different questions. Um, we can have different algebras that just give us the output or count or whatever for the same grammar. This is completely composable. Uh, we turn tricks into techniques. So there's a lot of trickery in dynamic programming in the conventional way. And it's quite arcane, and we want to make dynamic programming easier to learn. Um, I think we, we just have more words to reason about it and take these parts apart and these different phases so we can talk about them separately because otherwise everything's happening at once. Um, some of the disadvantages are, of course, textbooks use the old-fashioned recurrences. I had to dig through many pages of recurrences in my PhD. Um, another disadvantage is that it's limited to sequence-like data right now. So the problems have to decompose into subword-like structures. And that's why it's really useful in bioinformatics as it is. But it can be applied to other areas too, as I said. And actually this limitation is uh, only in the compiler for now. So in theory we already worked it out. It could totally work on trees as well um, and more complex structures. But in the compiler it just deals with sequence-like data right now. And <laughs> that's all I have to say today. Um, a big thank you for my previous work group, um, the Practical Computer Science Group in Bielefeld, where I learned about all these things and worked on the compiler. And I hope you remember the word reverse engineering of 42. And um, talk to me about your favorite dynamic programming problem. So come find me after the talk if you have one and show it to me and we try to get, to work, uh, try to get it to work because I like these kind of problems. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Um, okay, two questions. Uh, first, like, what is more or less the complexity in the end uh, of the average when it's executed? If it can be calculated depending on the complexity of the evaluation function and stuff like that. And second, so you develop your own language. Uh-huh. Uh, not it be possible to implement it some existing language? Yes, <laughs> these, uh, these are two really great questions. So, um, uh, the first question was about the complexity. Um, so, um, actually, we can use all kinds of different algorithms with this framework, so uh, there's no limit in complexity. You just have to make the decisions uh, which uh, things you want to tabulate. Uh, how many tables you want, you determine by how many grammar clauses you want. And then you say tabulate this thing, 
this one clause or uh, compute it on the fly. And this decision is up to you. Um, we have uh, some mechanism to figure that out. Um, we wrote a paper about it, but it's not super easy to do that. Um, so you can hand tune it with a keyword, tabulate. <laughs> and then. Uh, To compile it, or what do you mean? To execute it, like the cost and time and place. Uh, it completely depends on your problem. Yeah. Um, so, so for each table, you get like two extra dimensions. So if it's like a two-dimensional table, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, so, for example, the thing that I solved in my PhD it was uh, a forest alignment with this a fine gap cost, and for that. Uh, you had like seven different tables which have four dimensions. So it could completely be depend on a problem. Yeah. So what, what was your second question again? Sorry? If you can implement the same, like, I Ah, inside another language. I, I remember. Okay, so that's actually the history of this thing. So when we started, um, this was before I, I, jo I joined the school, but when they started um, working on this, um, this language was embedded in Haskell. So we wrote some combinators in Haskell, which were working like these alternative operators and so on. And we were building the grammar itself. Um, and this, this was done uh, with, with parser combinators. So the grammar itself was the parser and it was embedded in Haskell. And then we wrote a paper about how to expand it from Haskell and bootstrap like your own thing. I wanted to explain our uh, first question. Um, the, uh, regarding the complexity, is it possible in any way to derive from the syntactic structure of the algebra and stuff um, anything about the space complexity, time complexity, for example, the table sizes you talked about? Um, you can see it after a while when you work with it for a while. Um, you, you can see it. So, I mean, that sounds really <laughs> like, like a bad, a bad uh, answer to this, but um, I can see from how many clauses we have and um, the way they are structured, like how many dimensions of recursion they have. I can see how many dimensions each table has, and each table is one clause. So, if you think about it for a while, um, you can figure that out from that. But you don't know how sparse these tables are. So you could be wasting a lot of space in a huge table, and um, you could then optimize it with some mapping and to make the table dense. So that, that would be an upper bound. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But the complexity would, would largely, be, the, the runtime complexity would largely depend on your choice function, right? Yes. That as well. Like, um, so, for example, if you want to enumerate them all, if you would have the identity function, then you would go through the entire table. Yeah. And if you do something uh, where you do a combinatorial thing, like the sum, then you need this cell down here at the end of your table, where after you filled it, and it's dependent on all the stuff that you computed before. So you also need this one here. But for some of them, uh, you can be smarter. You can like do things even in parallel and have some... Uh, Kacheln, I don't know what that in English. Tile it, <laughs> tile the matrix, and be faster like that. So there are there are some more tricks to do that. But but the compiler always uses tables under the hood. Uh, the compiler always uses tables under the hood. It has some setup to do this um, uh, to do this tiling of the matrix, yeah. but that's kind of arcane. You have to hand fiddle a lot. Yeah. <laughs> because you can also solve all these problems without tables, right? But just maintaining a set of tables. Uh huh. But then it's very hard to reason about the complexity. Because yeah. And you also have this choice function, but <coughs> would, would you agree that, that like using a table is a good way of getting up the bound? Um, making sure that, that some complexity is not too Like if you have a two dimensional table, you, you can not really get uh, uh, cubic. Yeah, I think it's, um, it helps you for thinking about the complexity, and it also helps you. Uh, for thinking about how to organize your solution, because some of the things you compute, compute on the fly, and some of the things you would look up, and then you can imagine like how much are you actually saving by tabulating, and how much are you not saving by doing it again, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, why was the decision taken to take it out of Haskell and write a specific compiler for that? Uh, mm, research, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's also slower in Haskell. So um, with this, we can generate uh, C code. 
So it can be really fast. You can really solve a, um, a, a bioinformatics problem, which is essentially a big number crunching problem with this, and it's fast enough to compete with a handwritten solution, which is crazy, um, which in Haskell you cannot do. Um, but for example, in Haskell you can use some of the stuff that you have available from Haskell to um, make sure that you have the right things in the table. Like so both have their advantages. Okay, so since you're, um, since the problem is the creative part, it seems like it's important that you can play with the algebra that you choose. Mm -hmm. So do you have like an incremental version where you can use some of the stuff you computed before, you change out one of the algebra, for example, and you can use that and compute it beforehand? Yeah, that, that's totally how, how I work. I mean, I don't use the stuff that I computed, so I don't uh, store my tables. I think some people did that in our work group for some pseudo nodes in RNA, like some very specific problem, they did that. Um, but what I do is, or what I did a lot was, I wrote one algebra, and then I explored kind of the space, and I plugged in the second algebra, and then I come closer to my problem, come closer to my problem, and so on. So you're like plugging these different evaluations on, on, on to the other thing, to move forward towards your solution, if that makes sense. But I think you can do this other thing as well. I just didn't do it. <clears throat> I have one last question. Uh, does the compiler check the balance principle in any way? No, you can't. You have to prove it. It's important. You have to prove it. Yeah. Will it be possible with quick check to try to find a uh, counterexample for a few terms? And I don't know, but I want to know. That sounds good. Yeah, so yeah counterexample, I guess. Yeah. 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 Next paper. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, right now we have a coffee break. The tutorials start at 11.35 and the talks here continue at 11.45.